So I think, you know, going from state to state and tasting things specific to that area are one, one of the most exciting parts of a dining experience for me. If, if I shoot over to, to Victoria and, and get to taste something that's specific to that area that I can't even get in my own state, that's, that's what excites me the most. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Over the last year, many of us have stepped outside of our comfort zones to take on new challenges, ways to make our own lives better and for the betterment of the planet too. Sustainability in the food sector is a hard topic to wrangle because there are so many elements, so many links in the chain, so many steps that can affect the outcome. But that's not stopping many taking the big steps to ensure we are making a positive footprint on our environment. Kane Pollard is a co-owner of Topery and head chef of new restaurant, Soul Bar and Restaurant in South Australia. Kane, how are you going? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. You made a real name for yourself at Topery and we can take a deep dive into that a bit later, but you're also now the head chef of a new restaurant uh, to open in Adelaide called Soul Bar and Restaurant. Um, yeah. how, how did that come about and what's it felt like in this current climate given the year that we've just had opening a new restaurant? Yeah, no, it, it came completely out of the blue, to be honest. Um, just received an email from, from the head of kitchens there and they let me know that they were looking to open up a new restaurant um, on the rooftop at the new EOS Hotel and... Uh, yeah, they wanted to, to push the sustainable side of things a little bit further than they have in the past and really focus on South Australian produce and, and uh, what we have. So, yeah, they, they gave, me a, gave me a call and sort of went from there, went in for a chat and, and uh, yeah, seemed to head in the right direction. So, oh, very, very excited. You've been open a month. It's a bit of a different beast compared to Topri. What's it been like uh, sort of creating what you're creating there at soul bar given the size and the difference to what you're used to yeah it's been full on um definitely the the opposite end of the spectrum to what i'm used to as far as uh, systems and and organization and things like that goes but um i think i can see long term that it it will work quite well once everything falls into place um there's a there's a big support network there and you're, you're definitely not on your own so i guess the Utilising those networks is is an exciting part of being there. But um, also just being able to take the sustainable side of of restaurant and and uh, cooking in general, and the the use of local produce and making things in house to that level, and to be able to sort of shout it out to the world literally from the rooftop is a is a pretty cool part of it. I'm excited to to grow with it as it as it moves along. Well, that was the ethos behind Topery, which you're still a co-owner of. Can you tell us about how that restaurant started and a little bit about what you were doing there? Yeah, so uh, Topery started as a tea house about 40 years ago. It's situated inside of a nursery, which is a bit of an odd spot for a restaurant. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, we uh, myself and, and Adele, my wife, were looking to, to have our first little one and were looking to take a bit of a step back from the the hours of hospitality um, and looking to do more of a nine to five role as a chef still if possible and a position came up at the Topri Cafe Um, yeah and just to do basically a a light breakfast and a seasonal lunch offering Um, so I, I jumped in there and and saw it initially as a bit of a step back and and thinking about lifestyle rather than career um, but yeah, within a, a year and a half, I can't keep too still. So I, I sort of pushed things a little bit further than originally planned. And, uh, the, the current owner at the time was keen to step back and, and, uh, so yeah, I asked my father-in-law whether he was keen to invest and we could sort of push the boundaries there a little bit further than, than I was at the time. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been a long process. It's been nine years, it took, took probably about seven years to get it to the point that I was really happy with it. But, um, yeah, it was all, it was all worth it. It was, yeah, it's, it's an amazing space to be in. You were um, pinpointed by uh, Sol to 
because of your ethos towards sustainability that you were doing at Topri. Can you tell us about what some of the systems you had in place and how you put the menu together at Topri? Yeah, I think um, obviously sourcing locally was was the first step and making sure everything that we bought and received was from small growers and small producers and didn't contain any plastic um, packaging it was all it was all reusable packaging and crates and things like that that was the the first simple step um, and that sort of opened the floodgates a little bit and then we we started pushing things further making our own cheeses on site um, making our, doing all our own cured meats and making sure a lot of pickling and fermentation started to take place in the in the heart of the season um, yeah so it kind of got to a point fairly quickly that uh, we were, we were down to less than one household garbage bin um, per, per fortnight um, of actual waste leaving the premises. So, yeah, we, we started a composting system. We hooked up with a, a local composting company. Um, they helped us out with the plate waste and things like that. And, uh, yeah, we had an EnviroCycle on site, so all the water used was all reused in the garden centre. And, yeah, it just became this little epicenter of sustainability and and uh yeah all, all of the the garnishes and everything were, were foraged just before service daily so um yeah it just i mean to me it seemed like the proper way to run a restaurant like that um it was only sort of 40 to 50 seats so it was fairly easy to maintain and easy to to make fast changes with the seasons and yeah having having you know, local growers just bring in crates and boxes of things out of the blue just provided us with inspiration and and uh, to move forward with the menu. And, yeah, it was, it was an exciting place to be, for sure. You grew up in uh, the Adelaide Hills with a family that sort of um, grew – all sorts of amazing things. What was it, what was it like that time? Was that, a, was that a stage that triggered your connection with nature and food? Yeah, I, I don't think I realised that aspect of it until much later in life. Um, at the time, it just, yeah, again, seemed like a fairly standard childhood. But, um, yeah, so my, my school holidays when I was very young were spent uh, weeding and, you know, pulling stinging nettles from the ground in between the bunches of rhubarb and jumping on the back of the tractor trailer and planting seeds, um, putting together boxes and things like that. So, yeah, it was I was always connected to the soil from a very early age. Um, and then I'd also go home and and uh, go exploring with my brother. We used to be surrounded by chestnuts and vineyards, cherries, blackberries, wild fennel. It was just all there, there on the doorstep. And that's you know, what we did for fun was go and pick those things and climb those trees and follow those those streams and see where it led us. So, Yeah. When did you first get interested in in cooking, and what led to a career in hospitality? Um, I think it was in high school, early stages of high school, when home ec became a, an actual subject, and we were able to try a few different things and got taught a few different techniques that I hadn't obviously delved into before. Um, and yeah, not the most romantic story, but basically ended up going to a career counsellor, and they. Even though I did, uh, even though I was doing quite well in in maths and English and and science, apparently a farmer and a chef were my two preferred um, career paths that they that they thought I should delve into. And yeah, I I got a kitchen hand job as soon as I was legally able to work, and just loved loved the buzz of the kitchen and the the team team mentality and you know everyone pitching in to do the little bits to get through a busy service and then at the end of it having this huge sense of accomplishment hearing the the laughs and the you know the positive conversation people were having in the dining room and, and having that positive impact on their lives for that short period of time just seemed like a, a pretty cool way to spend your working life you've worked at some pretty notable restaurants in south australia what's been the the key sort of moments for you that changed the direction and sort of made you as a chef yeah um well i guess the first main one was at the, the siebel playford or it used to be the radisson playford at the time that sort of fine dining hotel style restaurant um moving my way up 
as an apprentice from the from the lighter section to desserts and then out into the main front area of the kitchen on pans within a year um, was was fast but it was exciting and I think the the relentless nature of being in hospitality at, at that period of time was appealing to me and the like the need for perfection and the need to yeah make sure everybody was was really enjoying what was going on and, and everything was watched down to a T and I think that shaped um, the fine dining aspect of of it which which is a I would say a small part of of my style of cooking I think plating is it is one part that I really enjoy but um, opening up the locavore up in Sterling which um, stuck pretty strictly at that stage to the 100 mile diet um, rules which meant no sugar was allowed and things like that so it was creating a menu that was purely made from things that that were being bought in by the growers and producers themselves most of the time um, and yeah I really loved that challenge that was that was really cool so that that probably kick-started the the local mentality and the from scratch mentality your food uh, is a little bit different has been highly awarded particularly in the last uh, couple of years um, can you tell us about your food and maybe a dish or two that you can take us through because you like to sort of hide this sort of um, the main protein under a veil and and you're quite playful on the plate yeah yeah um, I guess uh, pro- probably it was about two years ago two and a half years ago I, I constantly asked myself what what are you doing you know why are you doing it and how can you do it better um, and what yeah I just sort of woke up one day weirdly enough I don't know what the difference was this particular morning but I walked out the back of my house in in the hills and just started to breathe a little bit and and look around and take note of what was going on how things were growing what what colors were there what form and shape they were in and yeah driving to work um, that day I noticed a whole lot of little lambs roaming the field and they all had their heads deep in the weeds um, funnily enough um and uh yeah I, I just thought to myself oh, it's, that's wicked I haven't stopped and seen like you know a lamb here or there eating the grass but just this little group just with their heads buried and I thought that's very cool and um yeah I got down to down to Topiary and started working on a dish called lamb in the weeds and it became a one of those dishes that the core elements were always there but the the seasons changing um, were reflected as well. So the we we always bought whole animals, whole fish only, whole carcass only, um, with the only exception to the rule was if we were contacted by a butcher and they had certain cuts that, that weren't selling to the public that they could maybe sell to us and we could utilise. And lamb's neck was one of them. So, yeah, we, we connected with a local butcher a few k's down the road that always had a large supply of lamb neck and they were absolutely beautiful lambs. And so, yeah, that ended up being the, the main protein of the dish. And we basically paired it with something seasonal um, beside and then just went foraging every single morning and just picked a whole lot of edible weeds. And that changed rapidly. It could be quite floral one season, quite green the next. Um, yeah, so like you say, it got, got covered over in weeds and I think it was – one of those dishes that became a direct reflection of, of where we were at the time and, and people would pull in and see these weeds literally in the driveway and then it would be on their plate. So I think that, that connection was strong and that's probably one dish that put us on the map. Um, yeah, and then uh, another dish, uh, Fall on Leaves, probably started in the autumn period, but um, the plating was inspired by a trip to... Uh, friend's shack up on the coast um, York Peninsula and stepped outside with a cup of coffee one morning and sort of just looked down and there's this succulent growing out of the the hard as rock you know hot ground and I had this beautiful sort of curl going on um, it was sea lavender was the the variety but um yeah it was this perfect dome growing from the the ground with these crazy curls and this beautiful pattern and I took a photo of it and decided to start working on a dish that that reflected that it started off as a 
yeah, start off with a savory with a um, liver parfait down the, the base, and then we're sort of looking at different fruits and vegetables we could shave and curl to represent the curls and cover it over. But um, yeah, it ended up taking a dessert direction, and we made our own cream cheese and essentially whipped a whipped the cheesecake up with that, like a pipeable version of a cheesecake. And I think the first version ended up being a strawberry. I just had a beautiful, simple strawberry sorbet at the core, um, strawberry jam at the base, and then a lemon verbena whipped cheesecake sort of dome piped around that sorbet. And then we curled apples, just really, really thinly shaved apples. It was about 15, 16 curls per per dish um, to yeah cover over the dome. And, uh, yeah, then made a different fruit leather depending on what was around to kind of wedge in there to represent the fallen leaves. And, yeah, that was that's another one that's just stayed on the menu and been a, a bit of a staple and people come come for it and, and love it, yeah. That real focus that you've put on local producers, how important is that to what you do and is there some that you really enjoy working with? Yeah, um, I, it's... Yeah, I th- I think it it should be a much bigger part of of what the industry does. I think you know going from state to state and tasting things specific to that area are mm-hmm. uh, one one of the most exciting parts of a dining experience for me. If if I shoot over to to Victoria and and get to taste something that's specific to that area that I can't even get in my own state, that's that's what excites me the most. Um, so yeah, I, I think. Local produce is key not only for from that aspect but for freshness and supporting those local growers and making sure they stay in business. Um, I mean, probably my favourite thing to do is, in general, is go to the uh, farmer's market on a Sunday morning down in the city at Wavell Showgrounds. It's one of those proper markets that it's the producers and the growers themselves that sell. They're, they're the ones on the counter. They're the ones talking you through what's what's happening and, and how the seasons affected them that week. Um, so, yeah, Patland Gardens is is one there that's been our main fruit and veg supplier over the years. They've seemed to have found this, this beautiful sweet spot with producing large amounts of extremely high quality um, fruit and veg consistently throughout a season. And uh, so that makes it a little bit easier for restaurants rather than having to change things on the daily. It's... It's um, nice to have that steady supply of, you know, the be- the best tomatoes, the best the best brassica, uh, you know, that you can possibly get your hands on, um, very easily. And yeah, just a, just a beautiful old Italian couple that run it, and always up for a chat, and always telling you the, you know, the highs and the lows of of running that sort of business. And uh, yeah, love love uh, experimenting with random heirloom heritage varieties and getting your input on those sort of things to see whether it's something that you'd like to use again in the future. So, yeah, it just it just helps shape the menu, those sort of conversations and visiting those farms. It's what what drives a lot of what happens on, on my menu for sure. You turned the 40-seater topiary into a, a really amazing model of sustainability. What was the challenges involved in getting it to the level that you got it to? Yeah, I think... It's a it's a changing of headset, and I was I'm lucky enough to have had my whole chef's team's been there from anywhere from five to eight years, basically with me from the beginning. Yeah, so um, you come up with an idea for a dish, and and maybe it needs in your mind at that time a specific cut of meat or a specific fruit or vegetable at that point in time, and you can't get it. Uh, it's to to have those ideas and to have the excitement about those ideas and then sort of say, look, like we can't just get in lamb backstrap for that dish. We 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 need to use the whole the whole beast. So how can we, you know, morph that idea into something that's more in line with our thinking? And that that was probably the original challenge. Um, but once, yeah, once you keyed in and once the team understands that that is at the forefront of our minds at all times then that's what ends up creating the the influence and creating the the ideas that we move forward with so yeah the the challenges are definitely there um you know 
constantly sifting through the bins to make sure nobody's put the wrong thing in the wrong bin. <laughs> it's probably one of the less romantic parts of it, but at the same time, once once everybody knows, then it, it becomes quite easy to maintain. I, I think it's just investing, I don't know, probably a year, a year and a half in really hammering those rules and then then it becomes part of your daily life and it's it's no different to working in any, any other kitchen, to be honest. Yeah. How hard has it been translating everything you've built and learnt at the Topiary to Soul Bar, a much bigger, very different venue? Is it different changing uh, using that those thoughts and ideas in such a different model? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's been a big learning process, even writing a menu uh, in those surrounds where it was difficult enough at the start, but. Um, I guess the exciting part is having such a large team and such an array of of different um, experiences that, that, that they've had and how they can contribute to the way things are done. Um, but, yeah, sustain, sustainability-wise, again, it's the, the same challenges at the start. It's making sure the right things are being, being put in the right bins. It's it's uh, shifting everybody's headset to whole whole beast mentality. And before anything gets thrown in the bin, um, you know, in the green waste, or what what can be done with it? How can we use that as a, you know, maybe a waste spice? Um, for example, the other day we, we made a, a big batch of purple sauerkraut um, and then juiced that down um, for a dish and then all of the pulp that was left from that we dehydrated down. You end up with this beautiful, bright, vibrant, sour purple powder that it becomes – yeah, it always spice. I think just having those in the bank is is a really big influence and a, a way that can steer your direct the menu into a, a direction um, which you wouldn't normally get just buying something off the off the shelf. I suppose. Um, yeah, but as far as implementing systems in such a large space with such a large team, it's it's been a a challenge at the start, but everyone's starting to to get on board. And, um, yeah, I'm finding that I'm growing with the business, growing with the restaurant already. It's such a been a, such a short period of time and I'm already bursting at the seams to change the menu and get it more in line with what is going to work up there. So it's been a, it's been a bit of a rocky start in a way, but I can see what needs to be done and what direction we need to take it to make it make it work better for sure. Adelaide's food scene has grown exponentially in the last decade and there's some of the best restaurants in Australia there. Yeah. What, what do you love about the Adelaide uh, restaurant scene? Oh, it's, it's uh, like you say, it's grown exponentially. It's dynamic, I think. I'll go to the same restaurant five times over in a month and there will always be something different and new that they've thrown on the menu or thrown on as a special um, I think that the use of local produce is definitely a huge part of every South Australian kitchen now, which is extremely exciting. And it, you know that's creating connections within the industry. We're all we're all a big group of friends down here. Essentially, it's a uh, it's great to have that communication via social media and and uh, to drop in and say good day when we have time. But um, no, I, I just love the yeah the team mentality. And as soon as any you know, awards are won or hats are given. There's always that, you know, congratulations, that call, that message to say, you know, awesome to see you. You're pushing forward in what you're doing, and and I think everyone's on that same path. And it's it's really cool to be a part of it at the moment. It's an exciting time for South Australian restaurants for sure, and wine bars as well. Really exciting. You mentioned that you really love that sense of place in regards to a menu and the sort of chefs and restaurants that represent the produce of their region. Um, how, how would you describe Australian cuisine and, and how different it can be across the country? Yeah, I, got, I was asked that question by an incredible um, Italian food and wine magazine writer, actually, at Tasting Australia a couple of years ago, and it took me a good few minutes to, to think about that. But um, I think the, the difference between the world's menu and Australia's menu is that I guess like places like Italy, they do have those those staples. They do have their pizza and the pasta and the things like that that are who they are, and that's what you think about when you talk about Italian food. But um, 
you know, what do you think about when it comes to Australian food? And I think the Indigenous food scene is is really starting to finally gain some traction, which is really exciting. Um, but sense of place and, I mean, I'd love for more and more restaurants to start taking that 100-mile radius um, rule and just g- giving it a, a red-hot go because I, I love the fact that you can go to an Adelaide Hills restaurant and then you can go to a Fleuria Peninsula restaurant um, and get a complete different menu with complete different proteins, fruits and vegetables because they've all been grown from you know a little grower just down the road. And I think that's what Australian cuisine is. It's a, a direct reflection of, of where we are at that time of the year and um, and the relationships that we've managed to, to build with our suppliers and, and neighbours. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think that's what Australian cuisine is to me. It's a very transient cuisine that's a direct reflection of what's going on at that mm. point in time. The events of the last year has proposed incredible challenges for the industry but also opportunities as well for some. Has the last year changed you in the way you approach what you do? Definitely. Um, yeah, I, I think I've learnt the importance of taking a bit of a step back from the tools sometimes and stepping outside your usual uh, routine to, to gain inspiration elsewhere um, and to teach and, um, you know, work with your team members to, to try and grow who they are and, and what they're doing and their knowledge um, yeah, I mean, COVID, obviously, same with everybody, hit like a ton of bricks. We um, shut the doors only for, a, 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 I think it was a maximum of three days in the end, not even two and a half days. We, we were like, okay, we're going to have to shut things up for a couple of weeks and, and you know, figure out what to do. But I, I came home, I was sitting in the same room as I'm sitting now in the sunroom and just broke down and I didn't know what to do with myself because that's what I'd been doing my whole life and it just stopped and it went you went through the very quick stages of of uh of worry of um devastation and then you know I think within an hour and a half I sort of said to my wife what what are we gonna what can we do how can we break new ground how can we do something that nobody else is doing and and really make it an absolute positive and we we can grow we can keep people employed and we can we can just push forward through this and and be remembered as a place that that just dug deep and got it done um yeah so we started doing tasting menus at home which at the time um yeah didn't didn't see around so and that took off to be honest it was it kept us super busy for the um for the entire covid period it was very very cool. It was it was bringing the team together, and I think we popped a bottle of champagne or local bubbles, I should say. But um, and just said this this is the idea. How are we going to execute it? And yeah, we just nutted through. Okay, like how can we make it look amazing? How can we make it translate beautifully at home? How can we make it as easy as we possibly can for these families and these couples that are wanting to be out? They're wanting to dine. They're wanting to celebrate. They don't want to stand in the kitchen cooking all night how can we make it easy for them but super special and we we managed to as a team crack the code very quickly and uh yeah it went really well really really well topiary is uh still firing along uh beautifully even though uh you've sort of spreading your sort of time between the two venues but soul's very different what can people expect from from that um so we're still finding who we are. Um, I think the first menu I wrote um, was very much based around the use of, of whole animal and, and whole vegetable, um, which will continue. But um, I'm looking forward to, to pushing the barriers a little bit further up there. I think Topri was always a place to go for depth of flavour and, and local, simple, fresh um, you know, interestingly plated dishes, whereas um, the city, the city mentality, and that being on top of a a big gold building, um, you know, that the demand is there for something more. I think 
uh, which which I'm excited about. Um, yeah, we're making some menu changes this week to to kind of move down that path. But with a little bit of time, um, we're looking to get quite experimental up there, still keeping sustainability and produce at the forefront of our minds at all times. But um, yeah, looking forward to breaking new ground and and trying to create something extremely unique um, to match the view and the interior and and just the space in general which is yeah it's, a, it's an exciting time in my career for sure well it sounds pretty exciting you've got a busy year ahead no doubt Kane we've loved having you on deep in the weeds to share your story um, please keep in touch and we'll talk again soon will do thank you so much cheers this is the deep in the weeds podcast I'm Anthony Huckstep Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPA community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.